When I was a boy, I believed that the sea was boundless and indestructible to human pressures. Now I know better. Fish living there because they destroyed their habitat. As a nation, if we're undermining the traditional maritime use, we need for climate change, land-based source of pollution, habitat loss and degradation. Yeah, you know, away somebody is the rights and liberties. There's going to be a moment of truth for everybody. Everybody says, put it out there. Who cares what happens out there? Let's just get it out of my sight. What's on Mars, but we can't figure out what's in our oceans. It's almost a joke. Most of the world's coral reefs are bleached or dying. There are dead zones the size of small states off our coasts. Most of the biggest fish have been harvested, and there are places where jellyfish have become the catch of the day. And all at a time when we have to deal with aquaculture, wind and wave energy, even oil and gas exploration that are staking claims in our waters. The government's gonna do it, and they're gonna take everything. But I have also learned there's a smarter, more lasting course than the one we're on. At a time when our demands of the ocean are expanding at an unprecedented rate. And the failures of our outdated, piecemeal way of managing this life-giving resource are becoming abundantly clear. The time has come for a fresh approach based on stewardship through cooperation. In the small fishing community of Port Orford, Oregon, Aaron Longton and his colleagues are making a living off the sea in what they hope is a lasting way. A way that serves not only the community of Port Orford, but the sea life that sustains them in return. Port Orford's long-term outlook for the waters that feed them is part of a blossoming movement to take better care of the ocean for the good of all. It is a movement of scientists Businesses, fishermen, farmers, governments, and citizens who care for the sea. When you rub it one way, you'll notice that it's smooth. Oh, yes, it is. And if you rub it the other way, it gets a little bit rough. It feels like sandpaper, right? In 2010, the United States adopted its first ever national ocean policy. A policy that now calls for bringing together people from across the societal spectrum to carry out a new, far-sighted strategy for sustaining the country's ocean, coasts, and Great Lakes. It is founded on a branch of conservation, more formally known as ecosystem-based management, more simply, as a common sense approach to preserving life. It is backed by science and based on the needs of the human community in balance with that of its ecological provider, the sea. So we have things that happen right here in Iowa that end up affecting folks thousands of miles away, fishermen trying to fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Shipping is extremely important to this economy. 
We generate about a million jobs in California. One in eight jobs in Southern California is associated with the port activity, and then nationwide it's between three and four million jobs. So I see marine spatial planning as a tool that will help ports uh, delineate the area where traditional maritime uses are going to be protected. Scientific research. Do we need and it? We're finally getting it. Thanks to our reserve. If it's not too late. No, it's not too late. Our I said if. Yes, it's not. To meet some of the movement's pioneers, we will journey from coast to coast, as well as the land between. From the fishing community of Port Orford, Oregon, to farmers along the Mississippi River, to the Gulf of Mexico. From divers in the Florida Keys, to whale researchers and industrial shippers in Massachusetts Bay. All are now practicing a new philosophy of marine stewardship, of prosperity through preservation. Okay, we're now inside the Stillwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. This is an um, 850-some square mile marine protected area off the coast of Massachusetts. It'll stretch from the tip of Cape Cod all the way up to just about New Hampshire. And it's an extremely productive area, one of the most productive areas in the Gulf of Maine. Okay. She might come up right here again. You can just drift forward a little. Stellwagen Bank is a place of unusual richness, a mixing bowl of upwelling currents that brings vital nutrients from the deep and spreads them like fertilizer across the surface of the sea. These nutrients form the foundation of a vast food pyramid built on the uncountable masses of tiny plankton, feeding multitudes of fish and seabirds, marine mammals and people. When in 1992, Stellwagen Bank became a National Marine Sanctuary, it inherited a long and busy history of boat traffic. The sanctuary's waters are plied by all forms of vessels, and that has posed a growing challenge for the largest and oldest residents of Stellwagen. Well, the problem that we're trying to deal with in, in this particular piece is really North Atlantic right whales and humpback whales and finback whales, all these endangered species, being struck and killed by large commercial vessels. By that I mean uh, ships that are 300 gross tons or more. There's more and more cargo ships going in different directions from overseas and up and down the coastline. There's a lot of recreational uses, there's commercial uses. A lot of demand for wind power to be done out on the ocean. We now have two offshore uh, liquefied natural gas terminals off the coast of Boston. What was shaping up to be a collision of commerce and conservation at Stellwagen turned on a new path of cooperation. And there's all these competing uses for the ocean, and they're all valid, and there's stakeholders standing behind all of them, and we need to find a way to help them coexist and to uh, make sure that we preserve our resources for future generations. Knowing that some of the rarest whales in the world were dying in the shipping lanes of Boston Harbor, the Massachusetts Port Authority, Dave Wiley, and the shipping industry together set out to save them. The most immediate questions were simple to ask, yet hard to answer. Where do the whales feed? Where do they congregate? Where are the commercial ships traveling? And how fast? The answers eventually came by way of millions of little bits of data. All vessels, 300 gross ton or larger, are required to carry an AIS system or automatic identification system that was developed between us and the Coast Guard. And the way that we've done this is we've set up three antennas across the sanctuary. And the idea is that we can triangulate and get full coverage throughout the entire sanctuary. 
So what happens is the ship comes through the shipping lane or any other parts of the sanctuary. It transmits a signal every two to 10 seconds, giving its ship information plus also its latitude, longitude, and speed, and where it's heading, and what type of vessel it is. Stellwagen's lab collected more than 150 million records each year, pinpointing all the large ships within the sanctuary. Coming up, coming towards us. Determining the whale's whereabouts required different skills. Okay. The other one is still on the left, even though the flipper's over the back of him, saying you don't want to take the belly up one. You want to keep coming off balance, just like this, just like this. Okay, right, okay. Good place, and wait till she brings her back up. You're right on the right spot. Let her, wait, let her bring it up, let her bring the back up. Let her bring the back up now. Oh. Perfect, yeah. perfect. Whale researchers once relied solely on boats and planes catching mere surface glimpses of a creature whose wanderings reach to the hidden depths of the sea. With the help of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Wiley and his crew employed a new device called a D-tag, a miniature computer harmlessly fastened to the whales with suction cups. Eric, you want to swing to the right a little bit? Swing to the right? No, no. Under the bow, on the right. Okay, come to the left, 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 come to the left. down. Perfect! Oh, oh man. Beautiful. Wow. Very beautiful. All right. <laughs> when the tag detaches from the whale, a radio beacon leads scientists to its location to retrieve it. The D-TAG has granted us a far more intimate picture of their underwater world. This animation is based on the information gathered from the D-TAG. Here we see the feeding behavior of humpback whales as it has rarely been seen before. But the D-tag allows us to get down to the bottom and see that, in fact, they are doing this sort of rolling behavior and feeding on what you're seeing here, which is the sand lance right along the bottom, um, sometimes during the day, mainly at night. And superimposed in here is some fixed fishing gear, which you'll see here is a gill net, and then also the surface lines going up to the uh, surface. So as you can see, this animal did a really good job avoiding um, the potential entanglement. Other whales are not so lucky. North Atlantic right whales are found typically feeding near the surface, at a depth of 15 to 20 meters or less. 15 meters is also the keel depth of large vessels entering the port of Boston, putting whales into strike range. With as few as 350 members of its kind remaining, the death of even a single breeding female can tip the species towards extinction. So it's at that real turning point in terms of will the population survive or will it not. Each individual in that population is important. So one of the next things we wanted to look at is how serious of a problem is this. So another visualization here is showing you uh, again, the sanctuary is dropped into 3D here, and these are nautical mile uh, grid cells. And the height of the, um, each of the cells that you're seeing is, in fact, the dense areas where there's the most population of whales. Thompson and Wiley overlaid the shipping lanes and saw a collision waiting to happen. And the shipping lanes went right through the prime habitat. So I think you don't need to be a scientist to understand that that's not a good thing and that that increases the likelihood of a whale getting hit by the ships. There were also areas in the sanctuary that were less used by whales. So we decided it'd be a good idea, very smart, uh, to try to move the shipping lanes from areas that whales used a lot to areas that the whales used with much less frequencies. 
Wiley took his idea of moving the shipping lanes to the port operators group, presenting his data and offering solutions that were good for the whales. But were they good for the shippers? Because it was the first time that, you know, we'd ever been approached that at that level uh, in that detail to figure out what was going on in the ocean. You, know, you can't manage it if you don't know who's out there and what they're doing. So. Our initial response to the uh, the proposed shift in the in the traffic lanes uh, was guarded, and then uh, we had some concerns uh, for navigational safety. With a clearer picture of all the pieces, both the shipping industry and the whale champions realized their needs were not so incompatible after all. They'd have some more questions, we'd rework the data, and after about six months we came to an agreement of what we thought would be a particular um, configuration for the shipping lanes that would give us very good conservation benefit for right whales and the other endangered whales, and also would have minimal impact upon the shipping industry. The lane was shifted north to come in a direction like this. This would represent what the new shipping lane looks like as opposed to the old one. I mean, there have not been any incidents, so. Boston is not one of the largest ports in the United States, but it's, it's a vibrant port. And the thought being that, you know, if we're going to continue to have traffic in and out of port, which we are, then let's take some steps to reduce the risk of a, of a strike. The last thing that we want to do is to, to harm one of the animals with a ship, and, and, and nobody wants to do that. The shippers don't want to do that, the pilots don't want to do that when they're on the ship. So we, we want to take the steps and re-educate the, the captains and everybody involved so that that risk is, is reduced. Yeah. I think it's much better when you have buy-in from the industry on this sorts of decisions and if everyone from the Port of Boston was screaming and yelling and calling their politicians, it can really derail this sort of process to the detriment of the whales. But there's been close to 100% compliance with the ships following the, the uh, voluntary lanes and I think that's testimony to how much the industry really embraced it. Boston became the first port in the nation to change its shipping routes to protect marine mammals, reducing the whale's risk of being struck by more than 80 percent. But there would be little time for celebration. Because of our long-standing failure to develop comprehensive plans for the ocean, there came a new and costly problem from out of the blue. The project is a real good example of why marine spatial planning is really a key for um, managing the ocean in the future. Because at the same time we are moving the shipping lanes, the liquid natural gas companies through the Deepwater Port Act were working to put two deepwater ports uh, just a few miles from the sanctuary border. And in the area that we we're moving the shipping lanes to. Now you can't have shipping lanes and deep water ports coexisting. So now we had in conflict a project that was very important for endangered whale conservation and of course the LNG very important to the nation for energy independence and security. So he said, well, you know, we've just moved the shipping lanes to try to reduce the risk, and now you're going to be bringing these big, fast ships through the sanctuary. That's going to increase risk. So we need to do something to keep that from happening. Again, the questions to Stellwagen's new dilemma would eventually be answered by the whales. For in fact, the whales were speaking amongst themselves, as were most of the creatures of the sea. A phenomenon of vital, underwater chatter that humanity had only lately begun to decipher. Well, there are no deaf marine vertebrates. Fish, they're all hearing. Whales, they're all hearing. Now we're discovering that all the invertebrates, the lobsters and the crabs and the shrimp, they're all doing it too. In the ocean, 
everybody's listening to sound and most everybody's making sounds. Bioacoustic specialist Christopher Clark has been researching ocean communication for nearly 40 years. And with ocean noise doubling every decade, he is not liking what he is hearing. Finally, in the beginning of the 21st century, we're all waking up to the fact like, oh, noise from shipping, from oil and gas exploration, from recreational boats, all that stuff generates sound. And it's all smogging. It's influencing the, the habitat in which these animals are trying to exist. Research on ocean noise pollution has raised serious questions about its impact on marine life such as its potential to disrupt the schooling and spawning of fish, or preventing young corals from finding their home reef to build upon, or its profound impact on whales. What I'm going to show you now is a movie where we're actually taking real data collected in the ocean. It shows whales and it shows ships. Each one of these lightning bugs or stars represents the position of a right whale and the space over which that glow, that aura, radiates is the space within which that animal can communicate with other whales. Now we're going to actually put the real ships in there. We know what the acoustic footprints look like from the ships and those are going to be illustrated in color and so the, the brighter it is, the louder they are. And those are ships coming out of Boston, going through Cape Cod Canal. Here comes a big ship from down from Halifax. And notice the space. This is what I call the footprint. This is the acoustic footprint that that, that ship is imposing into this habitat, into the acoustic habitat of the whales. So if you don't see the, the starlight coming through from the whales that are up here, that means that the noise is so loud they can't be heard and their communication is shut off. So the ocean that 50 years ago, for these animals that lived to be 100 years, when they were teenagers, the ocean was quiet. They could hear each other across ocean basins or hundreds of miles. We're drowning these organisms in noise so their social systems don't function. The ecosystem gets torn apart. So this is getting to the point where we're talking about a noise budget, an ocean noise budget. So you get the shipbuilders to say, OK, we know how to build fire ships. What about all the noisy ones right now? One thing that you can do really simple, slow down, right? It saves whales, because you don't run them over. It's quieter when you slow it down. Clark's expertise on ocean acoustics made him the logical collaborator when Stellwagen began looking for ways to protect the whales while accommodating Accelerate Energy's deepwater gas ports. Well, Accelerate Energy I looked at the market in the northeast U.S. as far as there was a great energy need here and we have a solution to bring an incremental supply of natural gas to uh, the Northeast and that's where we developed the Northeast Gateway Deepwater Port. We knew coming in that the whales would be an issue. So I got this phone call from these guys at Accelerate going, hey you know what, time is money. Every day we're not in the water, that's, that's costing me a million dollars and people sitting around waiting to start building this terminal. Fix it. And guess what? It can't work 80% of the time. It's got to be bulletproof. With Accelerate's financial clout, Cornell's bioacoustic know-how, Woods Hole engineers, and Stellwagen's marine biologists all on board, the unlikely collaboration took to the water, developing the nation's first ever acoustic whale detection system and they will pick up right whale calls. Right whales make this particular call called the right whale up call. It kind of goes whoop, and that's a call that they use for contacting each other. And this particular piece of uh, equipment will record the sound of a right whale making that call, 
it shoots it up from the surface to a uranium link to a satellite, downloads it to Cornell. Cornell then University Bioacoustic Lab then will identify it. Yes, that is, or that is not a right whale call. That's the first arrival there. And there and there. And then in this case, the LNG companies are notified that there's a whale in their path. We made it work. We can now listen to the ocean. We have a network of these buoys right in the middle of the shipping loops. And these are positioned about 10 miles apart, so they overlap, and they can listen for whales throughout this area. As soon as the vessel enters the shipping lane, we reduce our speed to 12 knots or less. We put personnel on the bridge of the vessel, and they start generally scanning for marine mammals. Accelerate Energy is covering all of the costs for the whale detection system for the life of the LNG terminals, which is planned for 30 years. It represents about 1% of the total operating budget for Accelerate's liquefied natural gas port. Examples where we have it coming over multiple units? So this has yeah. given Cornell yeah, an opportunity to, to do things that they've not been able to do by having an array and having uh, year-round funding. And it won't surprise me if Dr. Clark doesn't find a way to develop a network that will reach further than Boston Harbor. I'm hoping that you know, we'll uh, have some part in that in the future. I think all the people in that group uh, came away being a little bit different as a result of the process. Um, you know, certainly the, the conservationists and scientists could understand the industry point of view a little bit better. Certainly industry could understand the science better and, and the conservation need. So if we work together on something in the future, which I'm sure we will and we actually are, um, I think it'll go about a bit easier. We have more confidence in each other to, to act in a, a straightforward and honest manner, I think, at this point. The success at Stellwagen has illuminated the power and promise that collaboration, better science, and better planning hold for our ocean. So I see this as a huge opportunity to finally pay attention to the ocean. There are a lot of people that are knowledgeable about the ocean, and what we're starting to do is sort of integrate that into, into sort of a more comprehensive vision of how does it work? and how do our actions impact that ecosystem. <laughs>